Hi, this is Corey Franklin with Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently, who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with an infamous personage, Gregory Powell. Gregory Powell died recently at the age of 79, and he was the gunman in a notorious Los Angeles crime of the 1960s, the Onionfield killing. As per our policy, we will not glorify Gregory Powell by showing his picture. Gregory Powell was a petty criminal who, along with his accomplice, Jimmy Lee Smith, was stopped by two officers from the Los Angeles Police Department on a March night in 1963. The two police officers, Carl Hettinger and Ian Campbell, were unaware that Powell had a gun underneath the driver's seat. And with his gun, Powell got the drop on the officers. They were kidnapped. They were forced into their car and forced to drive to Bakersfield, California, to an onion field where Powell killed Campbell. Hettinger managed to escape. Ultimately, the two criminals were captured. They were convicted and sent to prison for a long prison term. They were originally sentenced to death in the electric chair, but California revoked the death penalty, so they spent life in prison. At least Powell did. Smith got on parole and bounced back and forth between prison before he died. The case was made famous by another L.A. police officer, Joseph Wambaugh. Wambaugh was also a marvelous author, and in detailing the case, he wrote one of the great crime stories of our generation, The Onion Field. Here is Joseph Wambaugh to talk about The Onion Field Killing and his book, The Onion Field, along with Larry Harnish, a crack Los Angeles Times reporter and an expert on the case. This is Wambaugh. Uh, Ian Campbell and Carl Hedinger were working a uh, Hollywood Z car, which was a plainclothes unit, patrolling for more serious crimes. And they spotted a car that was suspicious at Carlos and Gower, and in the car was Gregory Powell and his crime partner, Jimmy Lee Smith, two small-time robbers uh, who were robbing liquor stores, or trying to. They got the drop on the officers, kidnapped them, and made uh, Officer Campbell drive all three of them in their car uh, up over the grapevine to the Bakersfield area, where, where uh, Powell was simply looking for a dark and lonely road in which to execute the two officers. I don't believe that his crime partner, Jimmy Lee Smith, knew at that time what Powell had in mind. Certainly the officers did not. And I should say this. At about that time, there was a series of incidents in the Southland where police officers from various departments happened to be... Uh, disarmed by criminals. I, I, could, I could cite three at that time. And the officers, once they were disarmed and the criminals got away, um, the officers were unharmed. So there was no reason for Carl Hedinger and Ian Campbell to think that they were going to be murdered by these two uh, petty crooks. Mostly it was uh, the story of the surviving officer, Carl Hedinger that drew me to the case, and I think that's why um, the book was such a success, and, and hopefully always will be, because it was the first time that I know of in the police service where someone dealt in detail with PTSD, which wasn't even defined yet uh, back then, 50 years ago or 40 years ago when I wrote the book. The Vietnam War had not told us what PTSD was all about. Uh, we certainly never thought about it when it came to cops. I mean, you know, cops were supposed to be tough guys. Nothing could uh, affect them the way Hedinger was affected, not just by the killing of his partner and the kidnap, but by his treatment uh, at the hands of his police department later. You can hear the police department in the background. Here's Harnish. It was a tremendous case. And of course, the questions were immediate in the newspaper. How'd these guys get out? How'd they get on parole? Um, both of them, as Joe said, were, you know, petty crooks. And they just kind of ran into each other at Fifth and Hill in downtown LA. And I think it was Powell recognized that Smith was wearing prison clothes. And that's how they hooked up. But they had never met each other before. It received massive coverage. Uh, there was an incident with anything involving the LAPD. Uh, gets anything like this gets intensive coverage. And when you go through and you look at the old clips, as a matter of fact, I was doing that earlier, Joe, and I saw that at one point, uh, because what happened was these two guys, uh, Powell and Smith, were convicted, and then their convictions were, and they both got the death penalty. And then the convictions were overturned, and they were retried uh, separately. 
And Joe, I was reading that Powell came back and wanted to stop sales of your book because he thought it was going to prejudice uh, jurors for the second trial, as I, if I remember correctly. Wombaugh again and the surviving officer, Hettinger. He was sent around to various roll calls uh, by the police department and ordered to uh, tell the troops uh, what happened that night and how he surrendered his weapon and what surrendering of the weapon can lead to. Well, the police department wasn't, <clears throat> was certainly not being sensitive at the time, but in all fairness, once again, they didn't understand PTSD. Uh, few people did. They didn't understand that Carl Hedinger was suffering enormously from what had happened to him and from feelings of incipient guilt that maybe by giving up his gun, it was his fault about what happened. However, he gave up the gun only when his partner told him to do so because Gregory Powell had his gun in the back of, of Ian Campbell. But uh, going to all those roll calls and repeating over and over how he, quote, screwed up, uh, led to an overwhelming guilt complex. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years or a year or so after the murder, Carl Hedinger was evincing very bizarre behaviors, and uh, people didn't know about it then, but he was shoplifting in a brazen way, in a silly way stealing items he didn't even want or could never use, doing it in front of witnesses, and eventually getting caught. And uh, when he was caught, and he was either going to resign from the police department or get indicted, uh, he did resign from the police department and became a gardener. Well, at that time, you know, I, I was very interested in the case. I worked Wilshire Division, which was a neighboring division to Hollywood, and I was very interested in, uh, in that uh, I've got three grandparents from Ireland. I know all about Irish Catholic guilt, and I got to thinking at that time, you know, could this officer, could Colonel Hedinger be suffering from overwhelming guilt, crying out for punishment? Because he sure as hell got punished. They were not called the Onion Field Killers then. That that moniker was hung on them and on the case when my book came out, and I called the book The Onion Field. I told someone, perhaps it was in a Times interview, uh, I said that I, I truly, during the writing of that book, felt that that's why I was put on Earth, to dig out this story, and once again, mainly, the part about Carl Hedinger, and to write the story of the onion field. I felt like that was my destiny. I think if you ever see the movie, uh, which was done so well by director Harold Becker, and it, a stellar cast, even though it was, a, it, was a, it was a cheap movie, we made it with very little money, it was an independent production all the way with our money, well, well James Woods, of course, <clears throat> became a movie star as a result of that book. And then we had uh, unknown actor Ted Danson, uh, John Savage. Speaking of the movie, James Woods gave a chilling performance as Gregory Powell. At Ted Danson, a newcomer was Officer Ian Campbell. I should check these two. Yeah. Yeah. What's a probable cause? Try no brake lights. Let's be careful. 6 zero four, 4 code 6 at Carlos and Gower. 6 zero four, 4 roger. Cops, take it easy. It may just be a traffic ticket. Jump in Jesus. What's the trouble, officer? Stay right there. Not that I know why you stopped us, officer. That little U turn back there. Would you mind stepping out of the car? Sure. Take his piece. He's got a gun in my back. Give him yours, Carl. Take his goddamn piece! Put your hands down. Put your goddamn hands down. Get in the car. You, big man. Get behind the wheel. You get in the back. God damn it, move! Put that flashlight on the floor and keep those hands on the wheel where I can see them. Get in the back of the car. Shut the door. 
head toward the ridge route, Bakersfield. All right. And don't break any laws. Don't try anything. Or you're both dead. Jimmy, keep your eye on him back and watch out for a tail. Let's go. What does Gregory Powell's death mean to Joseph Wambaugh? I, I was telling uh, someone from the Times who, who phoned me that maybe now I can drive by the intersection of Carlos and Gower in Hollywood and not feel anxious and not get a knot in my stomach, you know? I'm, I'm eager to try it to see if maybe I can feel at peace when I drive by that intersection. I've got a wonderful email from Laurie Campbell, uh, Ian Campbell's youngest uh, daughter, who was a baby when her father was murdered. And in the email, she said that maybe now she will feel thankfully at peace. We're going to move on now to Helen Gurley Brown, the editor of Cosmopolitan Magazine for over 30 years, who died recently at the age of nine. I like to think of her as the female counterpart to Hugh Hefner because her creation of the Cosmo Girl and her book Sex and the Single Girl were an important part of the sexual revolution in post-war America. Here's Bob Schieffer from CBS reporting on the death of Helen Gurley Brown. Helen Gurley Brown, the longtime editor of Cosmopolitan Magazine and an early advocate of sexual freedom for single women, died today after a brief illness. She was 90. Brown first made literary headlines in 1962 with the publication of her best-selling book, Sex and the Single Girl, an advice and opinion book which helped ignite what became known as the sexual revolution. It would later become a hit comedy starring Natalie Wood. See? We're holding hands, and nothing is happening. Something is happening. Three years later, Brown took over at Cosmopolitan Magazine, making it an influential monthly guide for fashion-conscious, independent women whom she called Cosmo Girl. Brown was Cosmo's editor-in-chief for 32 years. Even after stepping down in 1997, she held a permanent place on the magazine's masthead as international editor. Well, you have to hand it to her. She started out as a secretary. She moved up to a copy girl. She made her way to editor. For a long time, she was the primary wage earner in her family. Her father died when she was young. She had a sister who contracted polio. And when she was 37, she met and married David Brown, who was a co-producer of Jaws and The Sting and a pretty wealthy guy. And he encouraged her ideas. He encouraged her to write Sex and the Single Girl. And he encouraged her to develop her concept of the Cosmo Girl. After that, she became a major media figure. She was all over television, the print media, and radio. Here she is in an interview discussing her philosophy. Are you a feminist? I am a devout feminist. I was criticized during the beginning of the feminist movement for suggesting that women try to please men. Men are supposed to be the enemy. How could you possibly be nice to them? Well, sex is wonderful, and if you're heterosexual, you sort of want to have it with a man. So... If you want a man in your life, you have to be nice to him, but presumably they're being nice back to you. It's a reciprocal arrangement. Men love to pamper women, women love to pamper men. So to get to the point here, you can be sexual, you can love sex, you can be a sex object, heaven help you if you aren't. That's when you're in trouble. And you can still be a feminist because feminism has to do with wanting the best for both sexes. Sex, of course, is not the determining force in a woman's life. I say it's one of the three best things there is. And I used to say I don't know what the other two are. I finally decided what the other two are. It's called eating and breathing. <laughs> but it's not the determining uh, factor in your life. I guess health is the determining factor. Love is a very big deal, as is work. Interestingly, she never had children. Many people say that the times passed her by in the 80s, 90s, and the 2000s, but her influence was undeniable. As Linda Kelsey wrote in The Telegraph, to say that Cosmopolitan became the voice of a generation and has continued to influence several generations since is indisputable. It is the biggest magazine on the planet with 64 international editions from India to Israel, Hungary to Hong Kong via Mongolia and Azerbaijan. I'd like to point out that Helen Gurley Brown was a friend of Hugh Hefner, and she was also responsible for the first male nude centerfolds in Cosmopolitan magazine, the most notable of which was Burt Reynolds. And when that issue came out, it sold out magazine newsstands all over the world. 
Was she good or bad for women? I'll leave it for you to decide. And I'll leave you with a voiceover she did in the 60s for an old 50s instructional movie for girls. You can tell the movie from the uh, music in the background. How do you love a man or, or find a man to love when you aren't pretty? I can remember what it was like to be the less pretty one, and I can't tell you exactly how it works. I, I just know the plain girl power to intrigue a man is is there if you tap it. How do we unspectacular ones compete? Here are some of the trade secrets. Now, let me tell you a lovely thought you may not have thought of. Why is it flat-chested girls are the sexiest in the world? They have to be, I said, and it's true. If you lack the cleavage that's bound to please, but you crave love and, and to be courted just as much as the bosomy girl, splash perfume all over you, or better still, drench cotton with it and tuck it in your bra, then I, I think we concave ones almost will ourselves into a certain surface kind of sexiness at least. Perhaps it's why very poor but very brave boys in Mexico become legendary heroes facing death in the afternoon. There isn't any other way they can become famous or beloved. No football field, no corporations to work out in, so they make it with what they do have, which is guts. I do believe some plainish girls have a kind of delicate, delicious advantage, and that is their need, their almost uncontainable longing to make good with this man. Cleopatra had herself rolled up in a rug and delivered to Caesar, and there's quite a bit of evidence to prove that Cleo was a bit of a plain girl herself. How does it work when you're alone with a man? Well, for one thing, I think you never let your eyes leave his face. You simply go on the make in a very quiet, inside, physical kind of way, and you pray. Let your eagerness and, and desire, filtered through charm, of course, go to work. You turn on the plain girl power. All right, I think you get the idea. That was groundbreaking stuff at the time, and that was Helen Gurley Brown. We're going to close tonight with Ron Palillo. Ron Palillo was one of those actors who created a memorable role on television, and unfortunately, he was typecast by it. We've seen that before. His memorable role was in the 1970s sitcom Welcome Back, Cotter, where Gabe Kaplan played a teacher in an inner city high school who taught the Sweat Hogs, a bunch of misfits who in reality were quite charming characters. The most famous Sweat Hog was John Travolta as Vinny Barbarino. This was the springboard to his career. But Ron Palillo played Arnold Horshack, a sort of a Jewish nerdy kid. Now, in reality, Ron Palillo was an Italian kid. But he played a, a wonderful whiner. He often overacted, but he overacted right to the right degree for a whiny Jewish nerd who simultaneously bugged Gabe Kaplan and charmed him. Here's Ron Palillo as Arnold Horshack chewing the scenery in a scene from Welcome Back, Cotter. Please answer the question. What question? The question I just asked you. What was that? I don't know. I forgot. <laughs> it's okay, Mr. Cotto. It happens to me all the time. I raise my hand and I forget what I was going to say. <laughs> Maybe you was going to ask to leave the room. I'm the teacher, Arnold. I don't have to ask. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, Barbarino. But if you have to leave the room, it's okay with me anyway. <laughs> Try to remember that, Arnold. Okay. Can I continue now? Okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, Barbarino, you got yourself a press secretary. Now you need a cabinet. Well, for Mr. Carter, he's already got a locker. Ron Polo at his most charming. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I'd like to thank my producer, Sid Tapps. And as a tribute to Ron Palillo, our closing theme will be the theme from Welcome Back, Cotter. By the 1970s, the era of great themes for sitcoms was over. The heyday was in the 50s and 60s. But the Welcome Back, Cotter theme might have been the best one of the era, and that was due to John Sebastian, formerly the lead singer of The Love and Spoonful. Sebastian was a superb musician and composer. He was a leading figure in both the folk and rock movements, and he hasn't got the credit he was due. He was great with the love and spoonful, but he'll be most remembered for this. Welcome back. Your dreams were your ticket out. Welcome back to that same old place that you laughed about. God, tease him a lot, cause we got him on the spot. Welcome back. 
Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back.